Welcome to the PEAS Clinical Practice Guide for Pediatric Feeding Disorder. My name is Beverly Collison. Together with Melissa LaChapelle, the AHS Provincial Practice Lead for Nutrition Services, we have the privilege of co-chairing the PEAS Standardized Practice and Education Working Group. Today we are excited to introduce you to the PEAS Clinical Practice Guide for Healthcare Professionals which is chock-a-block with content, algorithms, tools, and forms. Before we get started, we acknowledge the very many health professionals from across the province who devoted countless hours to support the development of the CPG so that it would reflect the most current practice. With appreciation, we also recognize Rochelle Van Vliet, the project lead for the PEAS Clinical Practice Guide. The robustness of this CPG is testament to her dedication and the passion that she poured into it. The Clinical Practice Guide was the first deliverable of the PEAS project. For those new to PEAS, the Pediatric Eating and Swallowing, or PEAS, project is a provincial quality improvement initiative with the purpose of developing clinical pathways to standardize and improve the care of children with Pediatric Feeding Disorder, as defined by Gaudet et al. in 2019. For this phase of the project, our target population is children in ambulatory care settings, so PEACE has focused resources on outpatient and community care. That being said, you may find that many of the PEACE resources may also be applied or adapted for other care settings. This clinical practice guide is specific to pediatric feeding disorder. Pediatric feeding disorder is defined as a disturbance in oral intake of nutrients, inappropriate for age, lasting at least two weeks, and associated with one or more of the following medical, nutritional, feeding skill, or psychosocial dysfunction as well as absence of the cognitive processes consistent with eating disorders and pattern of oral intake that is not due to lack of food or congruent with cultural norms. It is important to note that a diagnosis of pediatric feeding disorder can be made in the absence of a diagnosis of dysphagia. In March 2020, the ICD Coordination and Maintenance Committee reviewed a proposal to consider adding pediatric feeding disorder to the ICD-10. PEAS is watching the Center for Disease Control and Prevention website closely, and we will post outcomes of these discussions to the website in the Community of Practice section. Family stories about their health care experiences can be a powerful tool to help teach, guide, and inform strategic priorities and influence our everyday practices. Before we launch into exploring the clinical practice guide together, it is with pleasure we introduce Mona Danda and her daughter Isha. Mona is an IT project manager for AHS and one of our many Alberta families with lived experience of pediatric feeding disorder. Mona agreed to share her family's journey navigating feeding supports in Alberta, for which we are very grateful. Welcome, Mona. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I was fortunate enough to be assigned to the PEAS project, and so this project is very near and dear to my heart as an IT professional and a family member. When this is my daughter, Isha, um, she's eight years old now, but um, I'll just give you a little bit of her clinical background. Um, Isha reached full term. Um, she was born through emergency C-section. She was in some distress. She had congenital heart failure, respiratory issues. Um, there was an unknown diagnosis of trisomy 21. And um, here she is being taken from the Sturgeon Hospital to the Royal Alec NICU by Stork. Uh, where we spent about four weeks in the NICU where she was tube fed and um, she was also diagnosed with um, permanent hearing loss while we were there. Um, and then the next slide shows you 
um, her when we came home. Um, so we did come home and she was, remo we removed the feeding tube and she, she made gains. She eventually learned to nurse and um, graduated to sort of dissolvable and liquefied foods. Her absolute favorite being yogurt and ice cream. Um, but then, you know, during her, our first year of her life here, it, feeding fell off our radar because clinicians focused on more critical factors. And we didn't really have a specialist, I guess, or, or you know, we didn't know who to turn to to talk about feeding. And although we, uh, we always knew it was going to be a challenge because we met more families that had children with Down syndrome and we saw some of the struggles that they faced. So, you know, if peace existed eight years ago, I, I would have taken it upon myself, or I could have, to learn more about feeding disorders. A lot of people would just tell us, don't worry, it'll work its way out. But, you know, I could have maybe completed the patient questionnaire on the site to, to see, you know, if I should be concerned or is there something I could be doing. Um, and I also believe it really would have prompted us to seek some assistance earlier than we did. Um, the next slide shows her um, starting to transition to solid food. Um, so, you know, her transition to daycare was quite a challenge. We had to acquire an aid. Um, by ourselves as our daycare had never had a child with special needs. She needed full support um, for feeding and all of her, you know, basic life functions. Um, so in this picture, she's actually nearly three years old. So she's sitting up, she's able to sit up, keep her head up at this time. Um, and then, you know, my solution to getting her to eat solid food was dousing everything in her favorite foods, which was ice cream and yogurt, because I knew that's what she loved and that's what enticed her. Um, and then I also started to feed her on the floor because that's kind of where all the food ended up. We also noticed as she was feeding, um, going to solids, that more food was actually like on her face than in her mouth. And um, again, Peace has got great information, including like specific handouts about how I could have graduated to different textures, like, you know, minced and pureed and food ideas. So I could have utilized that at that time. Um, and then the next slide shows um, her and her toddler years. Um, we kind of started to exclude ourselves from social gatherings because it was awkward and the way I was feeding her and how she looked was uncomfortable for me. And truly, I was just jealous of how easy it looked for all the other kids. Um, she couldn't communicate verbally and, you know, I was feeling like an all-around failure at that time. So my heart sang when I, I saw that there was a self-care component in peas because during that time I neglected my, my self-care and I neglected my other children. Um, so addressing that on, in peas is so wonderful. Uh, so during this time in her toddler years, oh sorry if you could, well, you, we, um, we saw a number of different SLPs. We saw um, and they gave us different advice, you know, different top tools. You'll see here, these are all like some of the tools we were pursued. We pursued. Sometimes I would just meet another family member that said, this spoon works and this person's selling it in their basement. And I would drive all the way to Spruce Grove to buy this spoon. Um, and I was just willing to do anything. Um, and we'd have a number of different handouts from different SLPs with conflicting advice. And so that left things for us to figure out. And it was a really confusing time. And at, also at that time, um, our, when the SLP we had that specialized in Down syndrome was charging $180 an hour. And you know we could really only afford to have three covered visits during that time. So my, my hope for future families is that peas can be used as a single source of truth. So we can all, uh, all of the information that I would need would be housed in a single lo location and it would outline supplies and you know what funding is available to me. Um, I just think this is going to be so much easier for families in the future. And then um, about when she was four years old we were offered specialized services through FSCD and then everything just went uphill from there. We had a multidisciplinary team, we had an OT behavioral consultant, uh, SLP and SLPA, and we actually learned about setting her up for success, um, you know, proper posture, not feeding her on the floor, working on her wiggle jaw, um, her sensory issues around her mouth so she could feel food on her face. And then we learned about creating the right environment to get her excited to actually eat solid food and use rewards. So, um, you know, she really progressed. I mean, in these pictures, she's still having ice cream, but she ate, her palate increased 
um, so much. So, her, you know, our family gained, made gains in those three years, but, um, sorry, she made gains in those three years, but our whole family really felt so supported during that time. And then about a year and a half ago, we lost specialized services and we transitioned her to a community school. And so now we're in a different phase um, at school. She does have an OT and an SLP through Edmonton Public School Board, but we don't get to meet with them. And because she has a cognitive disability, it just takes her three times longer to do most things. And, you know, so she's often offered, um, presented with the choice to either eat or play with her friends. So as you can imagine, she chooses the latter. And um, she's usually malnutrition. Like, I, I don't feel she gets the right nutrition during the day. She's fatigued and they are always talking about behavioral concerns. Uh, and I think that has to do with her lack of um, getting proper nutrition during the day. And you know, what I love about peas is now for the next year, I'm, I've actually looked at peas to look at how can I, what kind of utensils or containers can I um, pick up for her that might make things quicker for her. And um, I can access that information without a referral. And as my priorities change, like um, I can maybe drop, drop off looking into feeding for a week and pick it up again in two weeks. It just offers so much flexibility. And um, the last slide is just a picture of her a few, um, a few months ago, and she's a really diverse plate here. And it took her an hour and a half to eat this, and I don't think she picked up her fork and her knife at all that time, but um, she's made a lot of success. And as a parent, I'm, I'm so thankful to have peas as a tool. I wish I had it eight years ago, but I'm excited for new families. And also as an AHS IT staff of 15 years, I have never seen anything so tailored and customized to support families and not just clinicians. Um, and I'll just end by thanking all the wonderful clinicians here for, for everything that you do. You are so well loved and respected. And thank you so much. Mona, thank you for sharing your beautiful Isha story and journey with us. Thanks as well for explaining how your experiences have motivated you to help others, especially um, here at Pease and with all of us on the line today. We thank you. As Mona alluded to, pediatric feeding disorder affects more than 2.3 children under the age of five in North America each year. Through collaborative care and proper support, pediatric feeding disorder can be well regulated and treated. This CPG aims to provide just that, an evidence-based guideline to enhance pediatric quality I'm sorry, pediatric safety and quality of life. The PCPG is actually based on an adaptation with permission of the New South Wales Guide called Feeding Difficulties in Children, a Guide for Allied Health Professionals. Augmented with Gaudet and colleagues' 2020 framework for pediatric feeding disorder and enhanced with additional literature, re uh, literature reviews. At its core, the CPG provides information, guidance, and recommendations to support healthcare professionals in making clinical decisions about the screening, assessment, and management of children diagnosed with pediatric feeding disorder. Here's where to find it on the, um, on the PEAS website. So on the ribbon at the top of the screen, click on four providers. It will take you to the clinical practice guide. Click on read more. You can choose to download a PDF version of the CPG or use the menu on the left to navigate through the interactive online content. Check out the CPG quick reference. With one click, it takes you to an inventory of 11 figures and 28 tables. When you click on how to use this guide, you will see this figure, the pediatric feeding care cycle. This figure will recur throughout the CPG. 
It represents the assessment and management of pediatric feeding disorder in children as an ongoing and cyclical process. The inner quadrants depict the four distinct but interrelated steps in the pediatric feeding care cycle, diagnosis and goal setting, management, monitoring and evaluation, assessment and reassessment. Detail regarding the necessary actions are recommended in each quadrant and the outer ring identifies the components of the guide that relate to the steps. The conceptual frameworks of the CPG are based on a number of consensus definitions. Early on in the development of the PEACE Clinical Practice Guide, the multidisciplinary working group reached consensus on definitions for typical eating, feeding, and swallowing as well as pediatric feeding disorder and dysphagia. You can find these definitions in the preamble of the clinical practice guide. Likewise, consensus was reached on the scope of the CPG and a definition of complex care. This guide applies to infants, children, and youth with pediatric feeding disorder from birth to 18 years of age. It recognizes that understanding and agreement of the concept of complex care is at times confusing. You will see the model adopted by PEAS shows the relationships between family needs, chronic conditions, functional limitations, and healthcare use as they relate to the complex care needs of the child and family and how this in turn relates to pediatric feeding disorder, complex and non-complex needs. Feeding is a reciprocal process that depends on the abilities and the characteristics of both the parent and the infant and child. Focus on the feeding relationship and on the achievable goal of helping the child learn eating skills and positive eating behaviors sets the stage to establish a smooth and pleasant feeding relationship that is appropriate for each child's developmental stage, their nutritional needs, and their neuromuscular development. This relational approach that includes responsive feeding, a responsive feeding environment, and responsive feeding intervention is woven throughout the entire CPG. The first section of our walk through the CPG is screening. Screening is a strategy used for the purpose of investigation and is positioned alongside the pediatric feeding care cycle as an optional precursor to assessment and management. Feeding screening may identify the risk of a pediatric feeding disorder, so infants, children, and youth may be referred for a comprehensive assessment. Screening is not diagnostic, and outcomes do not provide information about feeding difficulty, severity, or best management. You'll see on the lower quadrant, left-hand quadrant, PEAS recommends the Feeding Matters Infant and Child Feeding Questionnaire. This remarkable online tool is available for both families and healthcare providers. It leads families and health professionals through a series of questions that use SmartLogic to arrive at a risk statement for pediatric feeding disorder. Importantly, as families and healthcare providers work through the questions, each provides education about typical and atypical feeding and eating development. You will find that this questionnaire serves as a robust platform to start a conversation with families care providers, such as say their family physician. After completing the Feeding Matters Infant and Child Feeding Questionnaire, families can return to the PEAS website and click on Find Services to locate services in Alberta. The next section of the clinical practice guide is the assessment section. Assessment is the foundation for intervention of every care plan. 
Assessment and reassessment of feeding difficulties includes working through a number of assessment questions considering each of the four health domains specified by Goodet in their framework, identifying where there may be dysfunction, and documenting. This is depicted in the pediatric feeding care cycle in black. An initial assessment of feeding includes considerations within the medical, nutritional, feeding skill, and psychosocial health domains. Due to interactions across these domains, impairment in one domain can lead to dysfunction in any of the others. To guide a thorough feeding assessment, PEAS identifies five questions to be answered within those four health domains. Number one, is the current method of feeding safe? Number two, is the feeding adequate? Number three, is feeding a positive experience for child and parent? Number four, is feeding appropriate for the child's developmental capacity? And number five, is feeding efficient? These five questions are listed in order of priority to identify, diagnose, and address feeding problems. The questions and considerations included in the CPG are aimed at supporting a thorough feeding assessment rather than being used as a checklist. Check out the CPG for more detailed considerations for each of these four questions and within the four domains. A clinical evaluation of swallowing is the first step in determining the presence or absence of a swallowing disorder. The evaluation addresses the, follow, the swallowing based activities of eating, drinking, secretion management, and may also include oral hygiene and the management of oral medications. To guide a thorough swallowing assessment, PEAS identifies one primary question which encompasses three dynamic assessment elements. Is swallowing safe? Are there signs and symptoms of decreased airway protection? Can physiological and respiratory stability improve safe oral feeding? And can compensatory strategies or diet modifications improve safe oral feeding? Instrumental evaluation may be conducted following a clinical evaluation when further information is needed to determine the nature of the swallowing disorder. Instrumental evaluation can also help to determine if swallowing safety can be improved by modifying food textures or liquid consistencies or positioning. The two most commonly used instrumental evaluations of swallowing for the pediatric population are video fluoroscopic swallowing study, which is VFSS, and fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, which is FEES. VFSS and FEES exams can be complementary and augmentative. Both tests provide information about modifications that can be made to enhance swallow safety and allow an infant or child to continue eating by mouth. Determining the appropriate procedure to use depends on what needs to be visualized and which procedure will be best tolerated by the child. Within the CPG, as you see on this screen, you will find indications and contraindications of both of these assessments, as well as their respective advantages and disadvantages. I will now turn it over to Melissa who will walk us through the management section of the CBG. Over to you. Thanks, Beverly. As we review the oral feeding management section of the CPG, I hope to provide you with an overview, highlighting some of the areas where robust discussion occurred in relation to practice change. As clinicians, once we have assessed and identified a pediatric feeding disorder, we can facilitate goal setting to address concerns of the child and family. Interventions to achieve therapy goals will be more successful when planned in collaboration with children and caregivers. Management of a pediatric feeding disorder is multifaceted and should be grounded in evidence-based practice. 
Oral feeding interventions should always consider patient safety the first priority before engaging in oral feeding. Medical stability, facilitating safe swallowing, optimizing nutrition, appropriate seating and positioning, feeding skill development, feeding environments and routine, sensory processing considerations, and oral hygiene all play an important role in the management of a pediatric feeding disorder, which we will review today. Management of all medical diagnoses is crucial to the success of other interventions. If feeds are initiated prematurely, a pediatric feeding disorder can be exacerbated. Oral feeding progress can change from feed to feed and day to day, which requires routine monitoring and reassessment as depicted in the pediatric feeding care cycle. In children who have been medically unstable or non-oral for a considerable period of time, confirmation of medical stability by a physician for appropriate initiation of oral feeds is recommended. We have listed a number of considerations in the CPG that suggest medical stability, which we've listed here. Any observations that an infant or child is at risk of aspiration or may be aspirating should be referred for further swallow assessment. Strategies to support safe swallowing function should focus on and prioritize feeding safety. Intake adequacy, facilitating a positive feeding experience, supporting development, and feeding efficiency certainly come into play once safe feeding is established. Management following the identification of dysphagia should involve a team approach. Reassessment is recommended whenever a child has a significant change to their health, development, medical status, or after airway surgery or extubation. Dysphagia intervention can include compensation strategies and rehabilitation techniques or a combination. Several management strategies are presented in the CPG. Pacing assists the infant to coordinate their suck, swallow, breathe cycle and allows reestablishment of a normal respiration pattern. Methods of bolus delivery, including nipples, cups, straws, and spoons, can facilitate normal feeding patterns and improve intake. Appendix 6 and the equipment list offer a wealth of information for providers and families on a variety of equipment available. Appendix 4 offers providers additional information on nipple flow rates. Children with dysphagia should be assessed for safety before progressing to more challenging food textures. Children should be offered food textures and fluids in line with their developmental capacity to support adequate nutrition intake and hydration. The working group also highlighted the need for a provider reference for thickener selection and recommendations for use. This information can be found in Table 9 of the CPG. All children with a pediatric feeding disorder benefit from a nutrition assessment as they're at greater risk of malnutrition and nutrition deficiencies. Oral nutrition support strategies to optimize food, fluid, and nutrient intake are often needed to support adequate growth and meet nutrition needs for optimal health. Strategies may vary based on the child's age, medical condition, current skill set, psychosocial factors, and current intake. We also want strategies to reflect the individual taste, culture, budget, and lifestyle of the child and family. In the CPG, you'll find recommendations for infants and children of all ages. We dive into supporting adequate intake, a healthy eating pattern, address limited food variety, and food texture progression. If oral nutrition support is ineffective, Enteral nutrition support may be considered as an additional or alternative therapeutic management strategy. In the CPG, you'll find useful tools such as this algorithm to support decision making. In this particular algorithm, the healthcare team first assesses whether the child is safe for any oral intake. Then we will consider our options to optimize oral nutrition support, such as high calorie protein diet texture modifications, oral nutrition supplements, and so forth. 
We have also included some suggested monitoring for reassessment of oral intake. If the child is not safe for oral intake, we would then refer to the enteral section of the CPG to support decision making with family related to feeding route, tube type, feeding regimen, and so forth. Sometimes a combination of oral and enteral feeds is needed to support the child to grow, improve their health status, which in turn may facilitate safer swallowing and feeding skill progression. In the CPG, we have outlined when enteral feeds should be considered, focusing on airway protection, intestinal function, growth, and nutrition adequacy. Appropriate positioning of the infant or child is essential for effective, efficient, and safe feeding for suck, swallow, breathe coordination. Positioning intervention will need to be provided to those children who are disorganized, require support to maintain a midline position, and may not have achieved or will not achieve functional sitting. Guidance on the proper positioning for breast and bottle fed infants, young children, support during the introduction of solids, use of high chairs and boosters, and for those with significant postural needs are included in the CPG. Table 10 offers a beautiful pictorial of postural needs and is an example of what you would expect in our CPG. Safe feeding may be facilitated by commercially available or specialized equipment, which you'll also find more detail on. Facilitating feeding as a neurodevelopmental skill and relational process has been emphasized in the CPG. Children with delayed or disordered oral reflexes will need individualized treatment techniques to facilitate oral motor skills, strategies to support facilitating first tastes, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, and provision of solids are cited. The Standardized Practice and Education Working Group has developed a number of family education materials to support skill development, which can be found on the website. Examples include facilitating first taste, introducing new foods to your child, and additional handouts on food ideas by color, flavor, and texture, as well as food play and new foods step-by-step, -step, which are now available for multidisciplinary use. I think that we can all appreciate that mealtime is not just a time for eating, but a time for relationship building, exploring food, learning mealtime manners, and developing social skills. A predictable mealtime routine and environment can help a child learn the difference between hunger and satiation and may help with self-regulation. We want to support parents to observe their child's behaviors, reactions, and communications during mealtimes. A child's ability to participate fully in the mealtime routine can be influenced by a range of factors, including the physical and sensory environments. Supporting a positive feeding relationship with positive mealtime interactions starts with cue recognition, supporting oral motor development, providing feedback on the child's efforts and successes, limiting the use of rewards, and avoidance of force feeding. Parents should be encouraged to use the division of responsibility to trust their child's appetite, offer child appropriate choices, and provide foods that are in keeping with their child's sensory preferences and oral motor capabilities. Each child has unique sensory processing needs and regulation abilities. How a child responds to sensory information during mealtimes may impact their feeding development and mealtime experience. Recommendations need to match assessment findings to enable the child to regulate and participate in mealtimes. Achieving a calm and alert state is a first step. The CPG provides strategies for food plays, steps to discovery, oral desensitization, preparation for meals, and supporting mealtime routines and environments while also supporting the sensory preferences of the child. As we switch gears towards enteral feeding management, I want to bring your attention to the oral hygiene and dental health section of the CPG. As health professionals, we all have a role to promote good oral hygiene and identify conditions that may negatively impact feeding. 
This also plays a role in management of enterally fed infants and children. Key messages for enteral feeding, including the importance of the interdisciplinary team and family in decision making, defining goals to ensure the quality, quantity, and duration of tube feeding are considered, and recognition that enteral feeding is a process that requires ongoing assessment to support tolerance, intake progression, and weaning when appropriate. Today I will highlight a few key areas where the CPG leads us to consider a change in practice. When oral feeding is no longer safe, possible or adequate, collaborative decision making between the interdisciplinary team and family is recommended to determine the optimal feeding route, type and duration of enteral feeding. The working group collaborated with physicians to create this decision-making tree, which emphasizes that nasoenteric tubes are intended to be temporary. Although controversial, research suggests that children have better feeding-related outcomes when we are cognizant of how long they have had their tube. Consideration of gastrostomy insertion is highly recommended when enteral feeding is expected to extend beyond 4 to 12 weeks. As there are risks with both long-term nasoenteric use and gastrostomy tube insertion, it is essential to consider the child's medical needs, overall health, ability to safely consume oral intake, and recent progress with feeding skills. Physicians and the interdisciplinary team should provide information and guidance to, to caregivers and their children as appropriate early in the treatment process to assist and support their decision making. Together with caregivers, we aim to determine the best option for the child in the short term and the long term as applicable. During the development of the CPG, literature review and consultation with both home nutrition support programs occurred to develop provincial feeding pump criteria. These criteria apply to the provision of pumps and exceptions would require medical and managerial consultation. The goal is to be family centered, but to also recognize the significant costs for the home nutrition support programs in directly supplying pumps to families who may want them, but not medically require them. Families can still source feeding pumps and funding privately outside the provincial criteria listed here. Monitoring enteral feeding should be child specific and is typically based on age, disease, severity of illness, degree of malnutrition, and metabolic stress. The American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition recommends that enteral feeding monitoring in the ambulatory care environment occur quarterly and include a physical exam, medication review, growth evaluation, tolerance of feed type and delivery, as well as an assessment of oral feeding ready readiness and or progression. As we monitor and follow up with our families, consideration for both short and long-term feeding goals should help guide enteral feeding adjustments and monitoring frequency. Transitioning from enteral to oral feeding should be considered from the time enteral feeds are initiated. Setting a clear platform from the outset prevents enteral tubes from being used longer than required. Supporting safe intake starts with supporting eating skills. This circles us back to an assessment of readiness for oral intake with a safe swallow. From there, we can collaboratively set achievable goals and consider the oral management strategies set out in the CPG. The approach to weaning enteral feeds will be different for each child. There are various tube weaning programs cited in the literature which suggest that appropriate, with appropriate support and monitoring, successful reduction or complete weaning from tube feeds is possible for certain children. There is no consensus on the ideal model for weaning as this is child specific. The GRAS model or various adaptations of its principles is frequently cited in the literature and proposes that the steps to weaning encompass hunger provocation, supporting eating skills, exposure to food, reduction of stress, acknowledging and responding to the child's cues, and avoidance of force feeding. At each stage in the, 
of the transition process, it is important to identify a limited number of achievable, developmentally appropriate, and measurable goals. Permanent removal of a feeding tube may be considered when a child is clinically stable, has safe and adequate oral intake, and can take essential medications orally. It is also important that future healthcare needs will not impact the child's ability to meet nutrition requirements and that caregivers have a clear understanding of the implications of tube removal, including risks of reinsertion. I would now like to welcome Beverly back to walk us through monitoring and evaluation. Thanks, Melissa. We have now walked through the screening assessment and management sections of the CPG. As Melissa said, the next section to explore is monitoring and evaluation. The purpose of monitoring and evaluation is to measure the amount of progress made for the intervention and determine whether the related goals or expected outcomes are being met. This is depicted in the pediatric feeding care cycle in black. Health professionals on the line will recognize that the time frame and frequency of monitoring and evaluation will be family dependent. For instance, for children with more acute issues, follow-up may occur more frequently, whereas children with a stable feeding profile may be seen less frequently. The final section of the CPG is transition. Children with pediatric feeding disorder will experience multiple transition points throughout their lives. An interdisciplinary and collaborative approach between the interdisciplinary team and the child and the family is needed to provide adequate support and to ensure that safe, successful transitions occur from hospital to home, pediatric to adult services, and perhaps discharge from an eating, feeding, swallowing program entirely. Within the CPG, you will find many tools to support family awareness of many possible transition. For instance, one tool specifically created for transitions is the oral feeding care plan. It is an essential part of communicating and implementing safe and successful strategies across multiple care settings, such as perhaps um, grandparents' homes, daycare, and school. A feeding care plan is also a useful means for documenting interventions that may also require extra attention and caution, such as those related to aspiration risk or allergies. You can find this on the PEAS website. Similarly, an enteral feeding care plan serves the same function as the oral feeding care plan we just reviewed. Presently, the Standardized Practice and Education Working Group and Nutrition and Food Services are working through the processes involved in developing a PEAS provincial form. We have reached the last page of the CPG. Thank you for joining us on this walkthrough. We hope that you found this exploration and informative. We encourage you to watch other PEAS presentations that give you a high-level overview of the website and collaborative practice tools for healthcare providers. If you have questions or comments, suggestions or requests, you can email PEAS or fill out this contact us form on the website. Please also consider subscribing to the PEAS news and events. And don't forget to join your colleagues in the PEAS community of practice. As we wrap today's presentation, we wish to share and celebrate some of Isha's successes and acknowledge the key roles you play in similar victories. We are moving into our question and answer period. Before we do, we would like to once again extend our thanks to all of the health professionals across the province who not only contributed to the working group, 
but also supported the development of this CPG. A colossal piece, thank you. We will now turn it over to Vanessa to moderate questions. Please use the Q&A or raise your hand feature to ask any questions that you may have. Thank you all. Wonderful, thank you. Um, thanks for your comments and feedback. Uh, also, Todd, thanks so much for letting us know about the um, downgraded tornado warning. That's great. <laughs> Um, Leonie, good question. Do we have a certificate of, of attendance from today's session? No, we actually don't have one, but that's certainly something that we can consider if you'll let us take that back to our team. Um, I don't know, Bev, or Melissa, if you had any other thoughts about that too. And what yeah. a great idea. Mm -hmm. It hasn't come up. I think, uh, Vanessa, would you have a participant list? I do. Yeah, I can see. As long as people have logged in with their um, email addresses, we can absolutely send you something. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of us getting that together. Okay, I'm just going to pull over Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth's comment here. On the website, following two items are mentioned, the pediatric version of the eating assessment tool, PDE10, um, and the Stollery pediatric screening, swallowing screen in development. Will either of these be available through the website? This is Beverly. I'm happy to field that question. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. We mentioned them in the CPG and provided a link within the CPG for the PDE-10. Right now, the Stollery Pediatric Swallowing Screen is still in development, and we are excited um, for the release of this screen, and of course, we'll be posting it to the website as soon as it is available to us. Probably a great place to um, to look for or watch for new resources and forms is the Peace Community of Practice. Great, thanks so much, Bev. We'll just wait and see if um, we have any other questions that come up from today. Please feel free if you want to um, ask a question. Thanks, Elizabeth. If you want to ask a question um, via audio, you're more than welcome to just raise your hand and I will unmute you as well if it's easier to ask a question verbally. Wonderful. It looks like people have, um, have had their questions addressed. I'm sure there's, I know there's a lot to take in. People will probably want to go and flip through or interact with the CPG online. So please take time to do that. And anytime you can contact us um, via our email, and um, we'd be more than happy to get back to you or interact with the group through the community of practice. Yes, we can send out copies of the PowerPoint slides. Um, what I'll do when we send out the survey after this is I can just attach the PowerPoint presentation at the same time. Thanks, that's a great question. All right, well, I, I feel think. like we're getting off easy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think then we've probably reached the end of our webinar, um, but thank you so much. I know we are just, oh, there's, there's a question. <laughs> All right, um, what's the general wait time for referrals right now? Um, does, does anyone want to take that question? If not, I can also try to answer that as well. well I would think that that's been covered in a little bit of the access and navigation work. Yeah, right, that's Vanessa? right, yeah. Um, so under find services, you'll just see that we do have um, a listing of all the different services within AHS um, for eating, feeding, swallowing, and we do set some wait time targets, but th they're not necessarily um, always being met, especially right, right now in light of COVID. Um, but these are the wait time targets that we've tried to establish, urgent two weeks, um, routine for six weeks. And um, each one of these services actually has a little more detail on their own Alberta referral directory profile. So like for example, under, um, we'll just go to the Stollery um, Feeding and Swallowing Clinic, and I believe that they have information about referrals and, and their wait times. Well, it it kind of just depends on the clinic, too, Len. The, the workforce analysis snapshot, did that include that information? 
It does. From the other group. Yep. So just, I'll oh, just wow. point this out um, within every ARD profile. They have tried to establish what their standards are. So the communication process is, is listed here. And typically you'll see these same dates um, across most services. Um, in terms of, Melissa was just referring to um, wait times for pediatric instrumental assessments. So when we did our workforce analysis, this was one of the things that we did. This uh, information was published October of last year, but is probably somewhat still relevant. It shows you where inter instrumental services exist um, in the province. VFSS, as well as fees that Beverly mentioned. And you can see what their estimated wait times were for urgent and non-urgent visits. And of course, as I said earlier, things have definitely changed with COVID, um, but at least you can see where services are located. Was there anything else that you ladies were thinking of too? Oh, look at all the questions Ooh, coming thank in. Thank you very much, Vanessa. <laughs> no problem. Sula, and I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Melissa, for your comment. I'll just pull that over, thanking everyone for a lot of work that's done. We, we agree, and as we said, it's definitely been a team effort. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for all the, the great feedback here. Are there any prerequisites to making a referral? For example, are community providers expected to perform a quick screen before referrals? Beverly, did you wanna take that one? I'd be happy to. Um, screening is a strategy um, for the purpose of investigation and PEASE has purposely positioned it outside of the feeding care cycle as an optional precursor to assessment and management. We're excited to have partnered with Feeding Matters Infant and Child uh, Feeding Questionnaire and we're excited that um, our physicians are really interested as well as um, health professionals say in well baby clinics are interested in adopting and sharing sharing this tool with their families. I'll also just point out, as I was earlier on the um, Alberta referral directory, oftentimes um, there will be referral criteria and just more information um, as well as a referral form. So for instance, I'm just back on that same one for the feeding and swallowing clinic at the Stollery. You can see what their referral form is as well. They have a link to the same questionnaire that we recommend. Um, and you'll just see here if there's a request for um, any additional screening information. But as Beverly pointed out in the CPG, we have just listed as the optional step. Wonderful, great, thank you. I hope that answered your question. Um, we'll just continue, carry on. Okay, well, I will um, just go to our last slide to make a plug for you to give us some of your feedback as well if you can just help us to um, make improvements to our presentation to our website um, and to help bring you new content um, as we continue to evolve with the peace project you'll see the survey link is at the bottom here um, it will actually pop up once you close your zoom link and you can um, click on it and just answer our five minute uh, survey uh, i'll also email it out with um, the attached PowerPoint. Thanks everyone for your attendance today. Stay safe, be well.